gives us a little glimpse of, of who, Jesus, who Jesus was and really, I think, um, brings, brings the humanity, right, to, to, to Jesus in our, in our eyes. All right, so let's, let's start in, in verse number one. He went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? Where is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? I want you to notice all these questions, and we're going to come back to these in a moment. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James and, and uh, Joseph and Judah, or Joseph and Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet, a prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown, and, as a, and among his relatives, and in his own household. And he could, and he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people. <laughs> And healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went about among the villages teaching. Now, in, in, in Mark chapter 5, um, there were the, like these three stories of, of just extraordinary, um, extraordinary faith and extraordinary miracles that were, that were seen in like some very unlikely unlikely candidates. Um, there was this one guy who was possessed by a legion of demons that Jesus cast these demons uh, out, of, out of this guy. And, uh, and then he sort of went out telling everyone as like this great evangelist, right? And so he went from demon possessed to evangelist within, within Mark 5, an amazing story. Um, there was, there was the lady with the issue of blood for some 12 years that was, that was healed. Um, and, and then there was the girl, the story of, um, of, of the, um, uh, the Cease girl or the girl who had died that, that uh, was raised from the dead. So there was some really extraordinary miracles in, in Mark 5. Uh, some amazing things that that we see happen there, um, but right after right after raising the the girl from the dead, like it switches very quickly. Jesus uh, Jesus leaves that city into into a, another into his hometown. Now in Mark one, we find sort of the opposite of this. Jesus is leaving his hometown and going to Capernaum. Right, and in Mark five, uh, most most Bible scholars and theologians would say Jesus was actually leaving Capernaum and going into his into his hometown, and and I want to read you I want to read to you these two different accounts of these transitional times in Jesus' ministry, and I want you to see the similarities, and yet uh, the the differences here. All right, in Mark one. And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority, not as, not as the scribes. So there in Capernaum, they were astonished and amazed at Jesus' teaching and so welcoming to him. And, and this astonishment and this uh, like the way they receive Jesus is what set them up to see the kind of miracles like transpired in Mark chapter 5, right? I mean, they were just blown away at, at Jesus and his teaching and, his, and his, uh, just, just who he was. But then in Mark 6, listen, listen to this, and he went away uh, from Capernaum into his hometown and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished. They were astonished as well, but in a little bit different way, because you can be astonished in a good and a bad way. They were astonished and took offense at him. Isn't that amazing? One can be astonished and be like just blown away and, and give us more, and the other is like astonished, and who do you think you are? 
Like, who do you think you are coming back to us and teaching us this stuff like you're somehow better than us? Who, who do you think you, you are? So listen to these. I mean, they ask them these, these questions, and they're, they're so interesting when you go through and listen to the, the, the questions that they, that they asked. And I just want us to go through these briefly, and then I want to give you one question for you uh, to, to ask yourself. The first question they asked him is, where did this man get these things? Uh, so, so from this, we could, we could see, like, they heard his teaching. And obviously, they were astonished by it, and they were blown away. But, um, like, they come to him rather with a, a receptive heart. They're sort of pushing away, saying, Who, where did he get this stuff? Like, we hear what he's saying, and it's good, but this is Jesus. So, like, how, how could he get this? Like, we know this guy. Uh, we grew up with this guy. Uh, where, where did he get this? So they, they heard us teaching, and then they asked him, what is the wisdom given to him? Like, so they not only heard his teaching, but they knew that he was wise. Like, his, his teaching was coming across to them as, as like, why stuff is as, as, um, uh, like very, very much a, a uh, someone who was, who was a great rabbi or a great teacher. They're, they're looking at Jesus saying, he, we hear what he's teaching. It's wise stuff. It's stuff that some chief rabbi should be teaching here. And how are such mighty works done by his hand? So, so Jesus is teaching them, not just teaching them, but teaching them good stuff, awesome stuff, wise stuff. And, and they're seeing the good things that he's doing, like even the miracles from his hands that are, that are transpiring. And so all of this sounds good, right? It sounds like, wow, there's good reason that they were astonished. He's teaching them. Not only is he teaching them, but he's teaching them wise stuff, and he's doing incredible miracles and things with his, with his hands. Uh, that's, that's awesome, right? That's good reason to be astonished. But here's where the offense came in. Is not this the carpenter? All right, is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? So then they go back to their previous context of Jesus and Jesus growing up with them. And they're like, this stuff's too good for a carpenter to be teaching us. Who does he think he is? This is the son of Mary. And, and, and really, um, many would say, that this, this idea of them calling him the son of Mary would have sort of been in an indictment upon not only him but his family because um, uh, a, a child would usually be called a son of their father, right? And so they would, uh, many, many historians and theologians would say that, that this goes to, to uh, prove that maybe even within his own community that there was this sense of illegitimacy in Jesus like and 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 so this idea of calling him son of Mary was really an indictment upon the fact that people didn't buy into that whole virgin birth thing right and and maybe they thought that Mary had conceived Jesus out of wedlock and that uh, there wasn't a, necessarily a miracle attached to this Right, so who is he, this illegitimate son, this guy that was a carpenter by trade? Like, who is he to come talking to us about this stuff? I mean, we grew up with him, we know him, and yet he's trying to teach us this. What? Many of you have probably experienced sometimes the hardest people the hardest people to share our faith with and the hardest people to be real about God with are sometimes the people that we're closest to. I remember being at a restaurant in good old Arizona, right? And, and I was sitting in a booth and I looked up and there was this sign that said, I can't relate to my relatives. And I just looked at that for a minute and I thought, truer words have never been spoken. <laughs> 
I, I mean, I, and, and for some reason, even if we're close, right, to, to, to relatives, sometimes, sometimes the people that we're closest to that maybe having those faith talks should be the easiest with, sometimes they can be the hardest. Why? Because they know us the best. Um, and I think many of us, perhaps with others, like we have these, I was, I was telling someone the other day, I, I think one of the struggles of my life um, one of the struggles of my life is, and, and I've been on, like Kristen Lane has, has opened all of our eyes, maybe to the Enneagram, right? And so I've been on this journey with the Enneagram for, for several months now, and I, I, I get, the Enneagram is this personality assessment that sort of pegs you, like where you are in your, who you are in your, in your personality, and, and, and here's what always gets me, it's not, when they, when they start telling you the strengths, you know, sometimes I'm like, well, I don't know if I'm this or I don't know if I'm that. But when they start telling you the weaknesses of those personalities, I very quickly know, oh, that's me. That is me. And it, and it sort of hurts, right? It's like, oh. I mean, I'm like, yes, I want everybody to know when it's just about my strengths. But when it starts talking about my weaknesses, it's too close to home. And one of the weaknesses of, of, of my life is like getting close enough to people where they like me, but they don't really know me. Like getting close where they, they, they will like me, but not really know me. And um, I, I think be, maybe because many of us perhaps have that bend in our life, it's easy to maybe share with people who we, we just want to, to like us because they don't know any of the baggage that we have in our lives, right? But when people know us, they know our baggage, like they know our pedigree, sometimes it can be a little tougher to have real and hard conversations with them because they'll look at us like, who are you to tell me that? I know what you did. You remember when we were on the playground, Jesus? You remember that? Like... I don't know if they called him out for not turning the other cheek. I don't know if Jesus was still turning the other cheek as a kid or what, you know. But, hey, you remember that. And now you're telling us about this. You know, wait, what's, what's going on here? But uh, so they're, sometimes for all of us, like the people that we're closest to, are least receptive to some of the things that we would share. Um, so, so this is where Jesus was in, in Mark 6. And I, I want you to imagine how hard that must have been for him. Like he goes to a place like Capernaum. He's received. People are astonished at his teaching and they receive him. And all these miracles are happening. And I bet Jesus wanted that so bad for Nazareth. Like not because he wanted to be popular. Not because he wanted to be in the Nazareth Hall of Fame. But I bet he just wanted that for those people that he loved and he cared about so much. He wanted them to experience healing. He wanted them to experience the miracles. I've got to believe that Jesus wanted them to know the promise of the Messiah. And it wasn't about his name being great. He just wanted that for those people. And yet, how must he have felt for those that he knew so well? To reject him so easily. I want to ask you this, this question. Um, because Jesus two times marveled in Scripture. He, um, he marveled. He marveled here in, in this case. Um, because of the unbelief. In fact, in verse 6, it says, He marveled because of their unbelief, and he went among uh, the villages teaching. But the second time that he marveled in Scripture is in Luke 7. But there, he didn't marvel at the unbelief. He marveled at the faith of the Gentiles. So I wonder for us, like when Jesus looks at us, I want to ask you, would he marvel at your faith or at your unbelief? Would Jesus marvel at your faith or your unbelief? Because when he went to Capernaum, like they had a faith and they received him, right? He went to his hometown, Nazareth. 
They saw him, they were astonished, and yet there was unbelief. Many of us have heard the stories, like we, we, we have the, the Christian background, but maybe, maybe we're like his disciples who said, Lord, I believe, but help me with my unbelief. And perhaps you know in your life right now that even though you work in a Christian school, you maybe carry the label of a Christian in your life, there's still some unbelief in your, in your life. I want to challenge you today to surrender that unbelief to Jesus. Surrender that unbelief uh, to Jesus and to take up that mantle of faith upon your life because I believe that just as Jesus walked into Capernaum, just as Jesus walked into Nazareth, I believe every day Jesus walks into the context of our life and he seeks to do great and mighty things. He seeks, to, he seeks to change the world or at least the context of our world through us and he's just waiting on one thing to see if we're going to approach him with belief or unbelief or a faith. And I believe when we come to him in faith, I believe we see God, I believe we see God work in powerful and mighty ways that will astonish us and cause those in this world to marvel. So let's, let's come to him with a faith today. Let's come to him with a faith, and let's let God do great things in our midst. Let's pray. God, we love you, and we thank you so much for your goodness. God, when we see uh, the work that you did in, in Capernaum, you raised the dead, you healed the demoniac, the lady with the issue of blood, we marvel at that, God. It's It's incredible. And yet so many times, so many times, um, we still have the ability to live with this unbelief that you can't do the same in the context of our life. This is the people of Nazareth. Uh, we've heard what you've done there. We see the wise teaching. Yet, you couldn't do that here. We know you as the carpenter. And maybe we've become so familiar with you, Lord, that we, we don't receive the supernatural. We don't receive the great things you want to do in us and through us because there's too much familiarity and uh, we've lost that sense of marvel and astonishment in you, Lord. And if that's the case, we just repent today and we just ask you, Lord, to restore, restore that which has been lost. Um, we love you. And God, we want to see you work and move in and through our lives. So would you replace our unbelief with a faith that will see you work in great ways? And Lord, let today be a breeding ground for that. We love you and we thank you for it in your strong name. Amen. Have a great day, guys.